What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Warren, I am a banker here in London and a property investor across the UK. My goal is to live free and independently from property, so I'm looking for an income of 3,000 pounds per month. If that's what you're on to, like, subscribe, that is what my content is all about. So guys, today I am gonna do more of a chatty, kind of non-scripted video. I am gonna give you a general update of everything that I'm doing in terms of property and my plans. Um, there's a lot going on, right? And usually my videos are topic related, but you know, I just wanna give you a general update. We're at the beginning of the year. What's going on now? It's kind of like a day in the life of a property investor in the UK. I wanna cover three main topics. I wanna to give you an update on the court case that I've been fighting for the last year. I don't think I've updated you since mid last year. Also wanna give you an update on the property that I'm selling within my portfolio in Liverpool and where I'm gonna invest next. So let's start with the court case, guys. Um, I have been fighting a court case, basically suing a developer. That has been part of the day in the life of this UK landlord for the past year. Um, long story short, I'll link the background video to give you the full context, but long story short, what happened was I looked at development initially back in March 2023, um, I put down a deposit and I exchanged on that property. It was off plan at the time, so they were building it. It was an office conversion to just over, I think it was 105 flats. And that whole development turned into a complete and utter <laughs> show, guys. By that, I mean there was delay after delay after delay until the point at which I actually formally pulled out of the transaction because I was legally allowed to because they took in so long. You have clauses in the contract that allow you to pull out at a certain time. And you won't believe this guys, but the actual development is still not done. We're coming up to three years since this property was first marketed to investors and it's still not finished yet. A uh, reason why I know that is because my Instagram page, I do a lot on my Instagram page, go follow me there. But I've talked about this there and I must have put a picture or mentioned the development and I got a guy actually got in contact with me to tell me that he's buying a unit in that development. And I've been following up with him for the last around about six months and I literally followed up with him, I think it was the beginning of this week, and I said, how's it going? Because he's still in the transaction, he's still willing to buy it. They still haven't finished it yet, guys. They're waiting for building control sign off. Um, absolute joke. So anyway, where am I at with that now? Um, I have what we call a default judgment from the court, which basically means a judge has decided, this is kind of like full and final say, that the developer has to return my deposit that I exchanged with back to me. Now the solicitor has my deposit or the bulk of it, right? I think I'm gonna lose about five grand. They have just under 10 grand and the judge has found in my favor. So they haven't even challenged it. What we've been struggling with for the last year is that their solicitor who hold my deposit have not communicated or responded to my solicitor at all guys. Imagine that, I mean, a whole year, my, my solicitor has gone through, there's a process that you have to go through in the courts to formally sue someone. And guys, it is long. There's certain letters that you have to write in specific ways. There's certain periods of time that you have to wait in between. There are stages to it. I mean, I never want to go through the court procedure again in terms of suing someone. It is long, it is convoluted, it is expensive. And really and truly, um, it's inefficient, okay? So anyway, got the default judgment um, a few weeks ago now, and that's been sent to the developer and their solicitor. I am praying, guys, pray for me too, that after a year of ignoring us, they see that uh, default judgment has come through from a judge, and they get sufficiently scared to return my deposit to me. Now, um, the big question is, can they continue to ignore us? And I asked my solicitor that question. Um, his response was, they would be very stupid to ignore a default judgment from a judge. So it wasn't a no, okay? I was hoping for a definitive no, they cannot, they have to return it. They, from, you know, when you read between the lines, because solicitors, they're slick, yeah? <laughs> they're slick. They word things in very specific ways. I've found that over the past year, my solicitor is great, by the way, but when you ask him yes or no questions, they really do the most to not give you a yes or no. It's more like it depends or they would be unwise to. I think it's just the way solicitor work, solicitors work. Um, it's not for the faint hearted, you know, if I was a highly strong 
neurotic, stressy person. This whole process would have added hundreds of gray hairs to my head and my blood pressure would be sky high. But I've taken the approach guys that I basically have written off the amount. I've written off the 15 grand and it's a lot of money to write off, but I'm like, I got to a certain stage where I like, this is gonna be a long drawn out process. I might not even get the outcome I want. So carry on with life, carry on investing, doing other projects as if you've lost the money already. If you get it back, amazing. And of course, I'm hoping and praying to God um, that I get it back, praying and fasting, all of that. And I've put it in God's hands, but let's see where that lands. You know, I think I've spent almost four grand um, in solicitors fees, just going through this process and court fees to get my own money back. Imagine that guys. Um, so I'm going to give it two more months and if it doesn't happen, if I don't get it back, I'm calling it quits because otherwise I'm just going to carry on paying fees to my solicitor to carry on pursuing them and you know, you might not even or I might not even get my money back at the end of it, right? There is an option to sue the solicitor to get my money back but God knows how much extra money that's going to be and God knows how much time they're going to leave before they start responding. It, it's just unknown, right? So. Guys, you know, I give you the highs, I give you the lows. I made a video not so long ago with me making, you know, almost 25 grand or getting a return of 25 grand off of a project that I did in Manchester. And 90% of this, my journey is making income, making money, getting good returns, investing for the future, setting up my life for the future. But I wanna be real and transparent with you guys, yeah? I'm not gonna hide the downsides from you as well. This has been a downside. What have I learned from this, guys? I have learned that I am not doing off-plan projects anymore. I'm not saying that they don't work. My very first investment was an off-plan project. The house that I live in now was an off-plan project that got built on time. But what I found with this is that my appetite for it has just gone down the toilet, guys. I'm not up for another one. I'm going for properties that are already built, that I can see, that I can add value to, and that element of risk in terms of depending on a developer slash builder to actually build the thing is, is taken out of the equation. I'm not up for it anymore, guys. Moving on, guys. I am selling my very first investment in Liverpool. That was my first ever buy to let when I was green in 2018. I'm selling it now, guys. Um, I like to review my portfolio seriously um, every five years or so. And when I say seriously, I mean, you know, what am I gonna keep? What am I gonna sell? Again, I've done other videos on this, but um, this property is not making, it's only making a few hundred pounds per year. Why is that? Because I have multiple tenant changeovers year to year on this property. So that kills the profitability. You have voids, you pay close to about 600 pounds in tenant fees, inventory fees, cleaning fees per changeover. It really does kill the profitability and the service charge has steadily gone up over the years. So I am selling it at this point in time. I have an offer for the property, cash offer, which is great. And what's going on now is that the buyer solicitor is going through a stage of searches and inquiries. The search and registries um, for like other charges on the house, environmental searches, making sure that the title's all good, all of that stuff. So I've been having a bunch of inquiries coming back to me about things like the lease, what is the service charge gonna be for the next year, all of that kind of stuff. A lot of uh, questions um, that I've had to go to the management company and a freehold holder, because this is a leasehold flat with questions for. Guys, it costs money to sell a flat or sell a house. I've paid, so I mentioned that there's been a bunch of inquiries that have come to me during this process. It has cost 700 pounds in terms of getting that information for them. These people charge you money to give you information that you need to sell. Going through the court system, I've realized how they just rinse you for money. It's really opened my eyes to how that system works. It is a big hustle. But selling a house, selling a flat specifically, is a hustle as well. Because you need this specific pack, it's called an LPE1, and it costs money. Most management companies charge you money to get that pack. And that pack has stuff like, you know, as I mentioned, what's the service charge gonna be? What's the service charge been for the last few years? Among a bunch of other stuff. You know, and one day in my life as a landlord, I spent 700 pounds. I wasn't expecting. Nobody really tells you this until you're like, oh yeah, you just think, yeah, I'm gonna need that information. Send it over, please. It's not like I don't pay you service charge every single year in ground rent. Um, you know, they're already getting fees from me, but they charge you more money to get information 
that I really think they should just give you. I mean, it's a mad one. So the next step will be once we have answered all of the inquiries, a completion date will be set. And luckily I'm not dependent on the buyer to get a mortgage and have that all, you know, put together and agreed it's cash. I mean, don't know who the buyer is, but very grateful for a cash offer. And by the way, I took a slightly lower offer. It was 10 grand below what I was aiming for, but I was happy to go with that because it's a cash offer. Less long thing, less complications, set a completion date, he's got the money, he's proved his funds to the agent, so we can get it done quickly. Now, what am I gonna do with that money when it comes in? I'm obviously gonna lose a house from my portfolio. Am I gonna replace that house in my portfolio? Am I gonna go on holiday? I am gonna replace it, of course. The whole point of what I'm doing is to build a portfolio so that I can go on and live independently, live free on my own terms. So I'm gonna replace it. I'm already looking at where I'm gonna go next. If you guys have watched my channel, you see my social medias, you guys know that I love Liverpool. I really do love Liverpool as a city in general, but also as an investing hotspot. It has been pretty much the second best performing city in the UK for the last, what, five to 10 years. Um, I really wanna stay in Liverpool, but, but I'm thinking with my strategic head, as I said, my goal is to live free and independently. I said at the beginning of every video, I'm looking for an income of 3,000 pounds per month. I wanna increase my income. I wanna maximize my income off of the next property that I buy. So as a landlord in the UK, I'm thinking, what strategy can I use on my next investment that's gonna maximize my income? I don't wanna do another standard tenancy with one tenant, six to 12 months AST. Not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I wanna maximize it. So what I'm thinking guys, is I'm gonna go into serviced accommodation, right? Now, if you don't know what serviced accommodation is, that's basically where you buy a property and you use it for short-term lets. So think Airbnb, booking.com. That's what I wanna do. Now I'm looking at different areas of the UK. What you really need to pay attention to when it comes to service accommodation is what are the planning laws in the area that you're looking to invest in. So I've been looking in lots of different areas. I'm still gonna stick in the north. Whereabouts, I'm not quite sure yet, guys, but I've looked at Blackpool, for example, and I actually saw um, a really good um, property up there. And if you're wondering why Blackpool, well, Blackpool is an area of the UK that gets a lot of tourism. It's on the coast. People love the beach. Um, it's popular. And I saw one in a very specific spot. It was right near the beach. Um, long story short, you know, doing my research, it said you need to, you know, be careful of planning when it comes. Because some towns, some cities, some areas, they do not like too much serviced accommodation, especially in certain areas. So if you're in a residential area, generally speaking, Councils aren't really up for a bunch, a whole bunch of serviced accommodation properties coming into that area. They wanna keep the peace. They wanna keep it nice and residential, peaceful. They don't want people coming in and out, making noise and disrupting the ambience of the area. So they're planning restrictions. So where I was looking, I basically wrote to the council. I said, this is a specific road postcode. What are the rules? I was basically out of the permitted zone that they allow serviced accommodation in by about two streets. They said, you know, this is on this specific road, you cannot get planning consent. I rang them up and I was like, ah, oh, let's see what they can do for me. I know I'm kind of out by two streets, but you know, I'm a responsible UK landlord. If we talk on the phone and I explain to them what I'm trying to do, you know, I'm sure they can sort me out. They were not having any of it, guys. So looking at other areas um, and you know, when I'm looking at areas, I'm writing to the councils and basically saying, you know, can you give me a breakdown of the zones in which service accommodation is allowed? So watch out for my update on that in terms of where I go next in the coming months. Once this sale is complete and the money comes in, I'll be looking at, you know, going to the next location. I wanna aim for a location where planning is not required for service accommodation. Popular area of the UK where visitors like to come depending on what the attraction is. And people go to different areas of the UK for different things, it could be a big it could be nature reserves, it could be stadiums, it could be concerts, you know, there's lots of options. So a couple of days per week when I put my landlord hat on, I'm doing research into areas of the UK, affordable areas, but where there is a appetite and a hunger for travel and attractions on a short term basis. So guys, that is a general update of what I'm doing. Let me know in the comment section below 
what you think. Any questions, happy to answer them, guys. Um, like and subscribe really helps to grow this channel, helps with the algorithm, and I'll see you guys in the next one.